It's, uh, it's an honour to uh, be here and talk to you today about uh, Radio DNS. Uh, it's quite interesting actually seeing um, the explanations we've had already around hybrid uh, technologies with broadcast have been um, predominantly about television, so I'll give you an idea of kind of where we're coming from, from um, a, a radio point of view. Um, I, I'll apologise as well, this presentation is usually shown at radio conferences, so it has a bit more of an introduction about what hybrid is. So similar diagrams again explaining how the two technologies work together, but I'll, I'll try and bring out more of the reasons behind why Radio DNS does what it does from an audio and radio uh, point of view. Um, so the question for radio broadcasters over the last 10 or 15 years very much been about do we do broadcast or do we do internet? Do we double down on doing everything over IP or do we still um, try and innovate and do new things with our broadcast infrastructure? And it's a very difficult question to, uh, to answer because both of those technologies have their strengths and their weaknesses. <coughs> so uh, just to recap on the strengths that we, we typically have with, um, with broadcast and with IP, um, broadcast is free for the listener at the point of consumption. Um, stable regulation, that's, that's uh, partly around content, so the role of the FCC um, uh, and in the UK uh, organisations like Ofcom uh, around the content that can go out on air. Um, but also around the regulation of technical standards, so for manufacturers, the, they know that if they implement an FM radio, exactly what that involves and how it works and the fact that it will work in many territories. Um, strengths of IP, uh, bi-directional, so you can do communications both ways. And um, the flexibility is mainly focused around the fact that um, on top of IP, you're always dealing in software, so you can make changes frequently and kind of innovate, innovate with things much more quickly than you might be able to do with a broadcast infrastructure. Which brings us on to the weaknesses. Uh, inversely, broadcast one way, um, and uh, therefore it can be quite inflexible as well with being able to uh, innovate and put new things on there. Um, IP a weakness is potentially reliability. Um, we know, e even here in the US, particularly with recent events with uh, hurricanes and tropical storms, the, the value and importance of having a broadcast network which can be much more resilient <coughs> to the likes of a cell phone network. Um, and also there are a lot of issues around uh, costs and uh, neutrality on IP networks. So. Um, the, the radio, once you've got your radio set, is free to consume, whereas IP, your costs are regulated by lots of uh, middle parties. And the issue of, of net neutrality and who plays gatekeeper with access and bandwidth to, the, to your content. Um, and so we very quickly, uh, uh, well, not very quickly, we've, we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years that the broadcast has fallen in, into two key areas. And, and that was initially drawn around the fact that 10 years or so ago, um, your audience fell into two very key areas. They were either at home on dial-up internet or potentially onto broadband, but when they were out and about, it was all being driven by FM radio on a, on a car stereo, etc. cetera. But uh, one very important change came about, which changed all this, which was the smartphone. And so suddenly we had uh, ubiquitous IP access everywhere, people being able to use LTE to uh, consume your radio station content over IP. But the interesting thing that came along with that at the same time was the fact that most of these devices do have an FM chip in them. So we've actually got FM and IP along at the same time. And so we go from broadcast or the internet to broadcast and the internet. How can we use the strengths and weaknesses from both technologies and, and benefit from the best of both and provide the best user experience? So that's where broadcasters are at. And where Radio DNS came in about 10 years ago was trying to um, define a set of open standards that weren't controlled by a particular commercial organization to, to allow radio stations and manufacturers to build upon them and do interesting things with IP to make broadcast radio better. And so we're, we're delivering audio using broadcast because it's absolutely the best way at this time to deliver that content to mass audiences easily and cheaply, and it's reliable. Uh, but then we can use IP to add a richer experience, and that's becoming really important in an uh, increasingly crowded marketplace. If you look at the, um, the connected dash on most modern cars, you are fighting against the likes of Pandora and Spotify, who... Um, against your station showing up as 87.7 FM, they can show a full color screen graphic, interaction, lyrics, you can interact with all sorts of things that are going on. That's where we need to be. 
And so radio DNS exists, exists uh, as two slightly different things. You've got radio DNS, the technology, and then radio DNS project, which is the organization behind the technological standards. So the technology uh, is all about defining the way that a broadcast radio can easily find relevant content on the internet. And it's a foundation. It, it then provides um, the, the kind of building blocks to put applications on top of to actually do those interesting things. But, but primarily, the technology is, is involved with converting radio stations to an internet address. The organization, on the other hand, exists to promote that standard and develop new ones and help people in, in getting to use and work with them. And just to provide a little bit of information about what Radio DNS does and how they exist, um, they believe on, on providing a decentralized access between the um, radio device and the broadcaster. Um, all our standards are open. Um, we run as a not-for-profit organization funded by membership fees. And uh, our intention is to be global in reach because we know that for manufacturers, they want to ideally implement one standard and one standard only because it's, it's cheaper and easier for them. And it gives them peace of mind and security that when they roll something out in a new territory, it just works. Um, and and we're, we're also trying to represent everyone in the radio ecosystem. So as was explained uh, before, my background is kind of in commercial radio in the UK. But we talk to broadcasters and we talk to manufacturers extensively and try and explain the, um, what can be the differences in opinion and approach and, and try and find common ground with them and, and help kind of broker these new solutions. So um, I'll, I'll go on now to explain a little bit about exactly how Radio DNS works um, and, and kind of what we can then build on from there. So. Um, the key technology needs to be able to receive a radio station over the air and then work out where to find it on the internet. And um, there are a couple of ways you could do that. And there are competing technologies in the marketplace that do it a slightly different way. So just explain the way that we do our approach. Um, radio DNS initially relies on the device to work like a traditional radio, to scan the band and find the stations that are available in its local area at, at the point that it performs that scan. Um, competing technologies can uh, use different approaches. The most common one that's used out there is to simply send a GPS coordinate from a device to a central server and get it to tell it back what stations are available. Um, the reason Radio DNS doesn't work that way is because it, it starts to infringe on that area that we talked about, about impartiality and net neutrality. Um, in that you need to be happy that whoever runs that gatekeeping service, you know which stations they're putting in, which stations they might not favor, how their licensing works, and what the kind of goals is for that organization to do that. So instead, the way we work differently is that we expect a device to perform a band scan and then define a way that the device itself can work out where these things exist on the internet. Um, so we have to start with uh, an API or a reference point. Um, and there are a couple of different ways from that band scan we could then look up the radio stations. So the most straightforward one would be to use the frequency. Um, the issue we have with that obviously is not just within a country, but even within um, a kind of reasonable geographic area, you're going to quickly get frequency reuse. That's not a good enough identifier to be used um, within a territory. So. We, we could also use GPS, and as explained, GPS can have complications. Even if we could overcome some of those um, policy issues around it, the problem we have with uh, using just GPS is the requirement it puts on a device to be able to receive and understand GPS. And also, computationally for the API, it's more complicated to be able to parse uh, the GPS coordinates into um, station information to work out what their transmission area is and where they lie, etc. Um, then you could also potentially use a combination of the two, but it, it still has the fundamental issues from, from each of those technologies, which makes it um, more complicated. And so Radio DNS um, went with a slightly different approach, and it, it varies based on broadcast platform, but for today I'll talk mostly about FM. So on FM, um, there's a technology called RBDS, which is a data stream that's inserted into the carrier. Um, the easiest example to show you is on FM radio. You've got the, the, the station text name, which will come out over RBDS. Um, and that provides quite a few uh, attributes in its, in its transmission. So as an example here in uh, DC, hot 995, um, we have uh, the program service, the PS code, which gives us the short station text, which comes up on the screen when you tune in. And then more interestingly, for a, a programmatic approach, 
We've got the Program Identification Code, which is the PI, and the Extended Country Code, or the ECC. And the, the uh, idea of the ECC is that in combination with a PI code, we can get a uh, internationally unique code for a radio station. Um, and for stations that don't have this, the, the typical approach is to buy us uh, around $160 RDS encoder to put into your broadcast chain. But the important reason Radio DNS picked this is that for most stations, this already exists. This is already a thing. Um, and so we can build a technology around something that already exists rather than having to put new things into the broadcast chain, which can be a slow and complicated process. So if we've got these attributes of a frequency, a PI code, and an ECC, and we want to be able to get to an address on the internet, such as hot995.com, uh, how can we do that? Now, we could run an API, as I explained before, like a web service, but that costs money, and it can be difficult to, um, to scale that, because the more people that use that service, the more requests it gets, the more it needs to scale. Um, and then we, we realized that what we were trying to do was effectively very similar to the way that DNS on the internet works. And just to quickly explain that, when you put google.com into a browser, DNS on the internet is resolving that to a IP address, which is the 216.58.213.78. That's known as an A record, that approach. And just to provide a bit more background that I'll come to later, there's a similar approach on DNS where you can put an address in and you get a CNAME record, which is actually a way of pointing one domain to another domain to build chains of trust. And so if we can agree on a way of taking those broadcast parameters and putting them into a DNS format, we realize that actually we can benefit from all the hard work that's gone into making DNS work reliably on the internet to make it work for um, a technology for radio as well. So um, the example I showed before, what we've done is we've converted the frequency here from 99.5 into a five-character digit, which allows us to easily have a complete range of valid FM uh, frequencies around the world. Uh, so 09950. Then we take the PI code as a hexadecimal. And then uh, this next value is what's known as a GCC, which is a way of making the ECC code completely unique internationally. So it takes the first character of the PI code, and then it takes the ECC value we saw before, which for the US is A0. And so we get 6A0, uh, and that represents the US. And then we've got fmradiodns.org, and that is like a domain name on the internet already. Um, the crucial reason it's structured that way is because the way domain names work is that at each uh, period in that address, you can effectively take a break and um, point responsibility somewhere else. So if we break it this way, it allows the flexibility for someone to be uh, in control of the US region or FM or specifically um, on some other broadcast platforms like DAB, which is in use quite heavily in Europe you cluster stations on multiplexes. So a multiplex address comes before a station address, which means the multiplex can all be handled somewhere else. That approach isn't currently being uh, used, but it's kind of built in there as a, as a future proofing technique. Um, and it, therefore, it allows us to be much more flexible about, about where we make these addresses work. Um, once we've got the, uh, this address, though, we can then do a worked example of kind of exactly how that works. So again, take, going back to our station, hot 99.5. It's on 99.5 uh, FM in DC. Um, and we know that it exists on the internet as hot995.com. So this block is representing the broadcaster. Um, they then broadcast over on FM. And in their RBDS, they are signaling a PI code of 6A91. And they're on the frequency 99.5. So the radio receives that radio station. And it can now build that address that I showed before based on the information it's received and perform a DNS query. And the DNS will respond with hot995.com, which then means that from that point forward, the radio can speak directly to the broadcaster because it knows exactly where it is that it exists. Um, and so the thing that's quite uh, crucial about that approach is that the radio DNS service is literally existing as a lookup service and nothing more. Everything else is then happening between the broadcaster. And the reason that this is uh, so scalable and works so well is because of the way that DNS works. When that radio first finds that station and makes the request, when you make a DNS request, you're typically speaking to a local um, service provider. So it might be your ISP, or if you're in a, like a corporate office, it might be a, a machine physically within the company somewhere. 
And the way that the DNS server works is that if it's never seen that address before, it forwards the request to another DNS server that it looks at. And ultimately, that will propagate all the way up to the, uh, the name servers that Radio DNS currently run if, if it can't find an answer anywhere in between. Once that result comes back, though, it comes back with a time to live, which is a number of seconds. And that result can be cached uh, more locally. And that means that future devices that are connected are more likely to find a cached response rather than ever coming back to Radio DNS, which means um, it can be quite resilient. You can take the Radio DNS name server down if there was an issue, and the local caches will start to fill in responses. Um, and it also means, quite crucially, that Radio DNS can't ever act as a point of knowledge to know how many people are listening to your radio station or who's performing lookups against your radio station because we only get to see a subset of the queries that ever come in. And that's quite important from the fact that a business model can't then be developed by Radio DNS to try and monetize that information. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that kind of explains the, the kind of decentralized nature of it. Failure doesn't, um, doesn't affect us and those connections happen directly. And so from that, um, those initial building blocks, what we've now got is the, the connection to the broadcaster's server, or, or indeed the service provider that that broadcaster decides to use if, if they wanted to. You can then build technologies on top of that. Radio DNS has um, uh, initially proposed three specifications, one for metadata, one for visuals, and one for interactivity. And they are all actually uh, Etsy technical standards as well. So um, they're, they're all kind of recognized technical standards. Uh, the first one I'll start with is around metadata, it's service and program information. Um, this is uh, essentially, what was formerly known as the EPG standard, but it's, it's um, grown to do more stuff than that. But it provides program information and service information, and that can be uh, anything from your station name, your descriptions, other frequencies a station might be available on, um, other broadcast platforms a station may be available on. Um, and it can also do program schedule information as well, give the names of um, shows, presenters, synopsis, keywords, more imagery around those. Uh, you can also put podcast information in there, so you can link a live program to its podcast. And by having all that information in there, it's uh, searchable. Uh, and the reason that measurable's on there as well is that for the broadcaster themselves, they now have an ability to monitor people who are interested in certain programs because that connection exists directly between the radio device and the broadcaster. Uh, when we're talking about logos as well, um, the standard has lots of different sizing information available in there as a set of standard logos. And it also, uh, more importantly, defines a standard where the radio device can negotiate a logo at a particular size, um, which has become really important as devices develop because screens are getting bigger and more higher resolution. And the technical standards traditionally were, were always a couple of steps behind as the devices grew, they needed to catch up. So by defining this, um, this new format that lets the radio device say, I'm this width by this height and this pixel density, it can get an asset uh, exactly as it intends. And this is uh, an example of what a, a, a compatible ra uh, radio EPG device can do. It can show you a set of radio stations with their logos. It can show you the program information that's on now and next. Uh, we can provide a presenter photo. We can show information about uh, the show that's on as well. It, it suddenly takes radio from being that frequency or that very short station name into being a much more engaging experience on devices that have the capability to do that. And the other point I made about the fact that the, um, the metadata can include frequency information and details about a radio station on another platform, that's crucial for doing um, something we call service following which means that when you're listening to a radio station, uh, for example, in a car, and you're in the transmission area of the station, so the example here is a station in London on 95.8 FM, um, that works absolutely fine. Until you drive out the area, you lose 95.8, and a, traditionally a radio would just go to static, and you'd be uh, set there trying to look for something else. When you've consumed the uh, data that comes over Radio EPG, however, you've now got uh, an IP stream URL which you can use, which means when you go out of area, you can flip to IP. And you can keep that listening experience going for as long as you're out the area. And then crucially, when you come back, flip back to broadcast again. And um, Audi have recently implemented our technology in their new A8 um, uh, cars. 
and they are using some very clever waveform analysis as well to line up the um, IP stream with the FM stream as well, so that you uh, you get a completely seamless blended experience. The radio just continues playing no matter whether you're in or out of the broadcast area. Moving on from uh, EPG, the next technology uh, is the visualization or the, the slideshow technology. Um, this is all about making radio look more engaging on devices such as the connected car. This example here is actually uh, Spotify running on Android Auto, and you can see that they're using visuals heavily to make that experience more engaging. Um, there are existing technologies out there already in things like HD radio, which can do cover art. This is an example of an image that's been converted to the correct size and bandwidth restrictions on HD radio to show kind of uh, the limitations of using the broadcast platform to send those images. And as an example, using the same content negotiation, the same image on uh, Radio DNS could look like that using IP technology. And it's about being able to use the right technologies available where you are. So if you're in an area where you can't get IP, then you can use these broadcast technologies. But when you can, it's much better to use IP because you can get a much higher quality visual. And these visuals still aren't huge. Um, the example we've done here is a 720 uh, image. We can compress it down to around um, 68 kilobytes. And over IP on a, on a fairly good LTE connection, in fact, not even a particularly great LTE connection, uh, we're looking at half a second to deliver that visual. So the experience, being able to flick between the two technologies, really does allow you to enhance it quite a lot. Um, and then the final technology I, I briefly mentioned was tagging. This is around interactivity. And um, the, the main use case for this is if you are driving in a car, you're unable to write down a note of an advertiser you've heard or a song that you really liked, having a very simple single button interaction to press to tag that event. And the idea is that, that tag event is then recorded and sent back to the broadcaster and it's linked against a, um, a user's login so that they can then go to another device and recall back the information that they previously tagged. The reason tagging in our standard differs from other things like iTunes tagging that you've previously seen is that it's not specific to song information. The only information that's ever sent over this connection is a timestamp and a broadcast identifier. So a music broadcaster would absolutely use this for tagging songs and eventually providing you a link off to see that video on YouTube or find the song on Spotify. But um, a speech broadcaster might link that tag event to who was currently speaking or the topic that they were talking about. They might have a fact sheet or more information about that. Um, commercial broadcasters can use this to link to advertisers so that the tag event might deliver a coupon to your phone or um, GPS coordinates to drive to your nearest store if it's a national retailer. Um, the idea is that the standard's written so that it puts all those kind of decisions and, and future uh, adaptions of the technology in the broadcaster's hands, but defines for manufacturers a very simple push button, send these specific parameters, you will receive back effectively an RSS feed of um, title, description, and image that you can show in a menu. Uh, another example on there is, as well is kind of listen again content. You can make it to tag to get a podcast as well. Um, and the other crucial thing about this, again, is it gives uh, engagement measurement because the broadcaster is receiving that tag event directly so they can tell exactly how many people have tagged a specific piece of content. And that's kind of where we are so far. <laughs> the whole point of these technologies all being individual modules that build up together is that more modules can be built and it can be adapted and it can grow. And the one thing that we're really keen on at Radio DNS is encouraging more people to become members and get involved in the project and help us define new technologies and think of new approaches that we can do it. And the reason we think that's really important is this, uh, this quote that um, I, I've seen before, that in a digital world, you are invisible without accurate metadata and good content, and the risk to radio is not existence, but prominence. So if we're not doing these things, people aren't going to find our content, and it's going to become more and more difficult when we've got other competitors. So to summarize, um, broadcast, uh, absolutely the most appropriate method of delivering content to a large number of people in a large area. Um, IP, however, does have many of those benefits that we've talked about over broadcast, and it can ensure prominence against other media. Hybrid approach helps bring those things together, and Radio DNS is all about developing and operating open and distributed standards to help enable hybrid radio. And uh, if you'd like to get uh, involved or find out more information about the project, the web address is down there at the bottom, and also you can get in touch with us on Twitter. And I think I've got a couple of minutes for questions, three minutes for questions, if anyone has any questions. <laughs>
you talked about uninterrupted listening. I'm just curious as to what kind of criteria the receiver might use to determine when it's going to blend to the IP stream and back. And if you're in an area where there's a lot of terrain and you're ping-ponging back and forth, does that become annoying to the listener at all? Yeah, so the technical specifications themselves don't define what a manufacturer should consider to be a poor signal and when they should switch. Uh, however, we've had quite a lot of practical experience with manufacturers implementing the technology. Um, they've typically found that they start the IP stream well before they consider their threshold for FM reception um, to be unacceptable so that they can do a more seamless blend. And they also have like a timeout hold off so they may wait 30 to 40 seconds before they would consider going back to a signal and also monitoring that if that same signal is still continuing to ping pong, that you're absolutely right. It may actually be more preferential to stay for IP longer than to keep trying to flip backwards and forwards. But the, the general rule is always that you favor broadcast wherever possible, but with those considerations in mind. You explained how the radio can parse out the uh the parts of the IP, of the domain name on the left sides of the dots, and that it can, and typically you parse on the dots themselves. What de defines the authoritative name server for your group? Is it always going to be Radio DNS, or you mentioned that there might be other organizations providing that same service? How does the radio know which one to use as the authoritative domain server? Sure. So the technical specification defines RadioDNS.org as being the suffix on the end of the domain. So that's always intended to be that way as the current specification stands. Um, that delegation that I talked about is more to do with NS records. So you can take a subset of that domain and, and on an NS record for name server, you can point that to a different entity. So there is a way that in the technology, you can later say this range is going to actually belong to somebody else. But it ultimately has to hinge on a specific um, domain for the manufacturers to know what to base their initial look upon. <laughs>